Hey guys, Andy here, and today is my 16 year YouTube anniversary. Now, normally for these anniversary videos, I like to talk about my time on the platform, how I got started, where I've gone, stuff like that. But today, I decided to do something a little different. So if you are interested in hearing about my journey onto YouTube thus far, uh, check out my previous year's anniversary, the 15 year anniversary on YouTube. But for today, the big sweet 16, I decided to answer 16 questions about life on YouTube. So question number one, what would I be doing if I wasn't doing this, YouTube? It's hard to imagine me really doing anything else because YouTube has been such a big part of my life for a long portion of my life. But before YouTube, I was interested in working in IT, computers, software mostly, wasn't really much of a hardware guy. So I figure if YouTube wasn't a thing or if I just didn't become interested in it, I'd probably be working somewhere in IT in some department. So question number two, what is the best comment I ever received? Well, it's hard to say which comment in particular was the best I've ever received because I've received a lot of good ones over these past 16 years. But a lot of them, a lot of the really good ones that really stand out for me are the ones from people I really look up to in the YouTube space. You know, seeing comments from Tokyo Kuni, uh, seeing the old comments from the late great Roger Swan, and also seeing comments from people who I've inspired over the years. Even though I may not have a, a massive audience like a lot of other YouTubers have, but just to know that just little old me from nowhere Ohio can enact positive change onto other people's lives is a very incredibly rewarding part of doing YouTube. So seeing those types of comments of, you know, hey, I was kind of going nowhere in life and I decided to join the military or, hey, you know, I saw you studying abroad in Japan and thought, hey, that might be something I'm interested in doing too. So question number three, what one event inspired me to do this whole YouTube thing? It's kind of a combination of things and I've explained it a lot in my origin story videos. But as far as me even signing up to YouTube to begin with, it was to subscribe to a lot of the early YouTube channels and a lot of the OG J vloggers, like I've mentioned before. But as far as me making content, that was inspired by, like I said, a lot of the early J vloggers of the time and just me wanting to get into that space however I could. So I decided to grab a camera off of eBay, use it to sell some stuff on eBay and also do some vlogging on the side just to get the hang of things. So question number four, when I first started out, was I embarrassed to tell people what I did? Yes, extremely, because when I started, YouTube was very new and there was really nobody on the platform that I could look to and be like, yeah, I'm, I'm like that person or I'm like this company or whatever, because not even YouTube knew what YouTube was back then. So when I was walking around my hometown in Salina, Ohio with a little camcorder, people are like, what the hell are you doing, dude? Are you, are you working for the FBI, man? Are you like an undercover cop? Like what the hell's going on here, dude? <laughs> you know, they're just kind of giving me the stink eye most of the time, which is why I did a lot of my filming indoors. So I didn't have to worry about people kind of looking at me funny for just vlogging out and about in public. And it's something even after all this time, it's something that I still, kind of deal with, although I will say a lot of the, the initial stigma behind YouTube has largely washed away. So if people see you with the camera, they usually react with a lot more positivity. Like, oh my God, are you filming a YouTube video, dude? Are you a YouTuber? Oh my gosh, that's so interesting. Rather than just asking me if I work for the government. <laughs> so question number five, what is one falsehood that I've said in my videos in the past? Doing YouTube for over 16 years, you grow a lot as a person and you see and experience a whole bevy of new things over the years. So the Andy that I was back in 2006, 2008 is a lot different than the Andy now in 2022. And I'm hoping it'll be a much different Andy in 2032. I wouldn't really say falsehoods per se, but maybe just misconceptions 
on some things. It's just like a lot of little things here and there, you know, and as stuff changes, you know, it's hard to agree with a lot of those things. I guess if I had to really pinpoint one falsehood, the barrier to entry on YouTube is extremely low. In fact, it's non-existent. So while I still agree with that sentiment to an extent, there's also a whole lot more YouTubers and a whole, whole lot more production value put into YouTube videos now than there was back then. So you get people like me with the fancy microphones and the fancy cameras with the fancy lenses trying to put together a YouTube video. Then you got, you know, other people just out there making all kinds of cinematic masterpieces. And then you got random people with uh, the little phones with, you know, the 280p shaking and just capturing something interesting. So it's hard to say these days, to be honest. But I will say that everybody should at least try to be a YouTuber. Even if you're not successful, you only get a handful of subs, if any. At least give it a try and you never know. You might be the one talking 16 years later about your time on YouTube. So question number six, when did I realize I was famous? Well, it's been 16 years and I still haven't realized it, so. <laughs> but no, nah, seriously, um, I don't really consider myself famous at all, but apparently within the YouTube sphere, especially since I do videos about Japan in Japan, it definitely narrows things down a bit. So if I'm out and about in town, you know, every once in a while I get uh, messages from people who'll be like, Andy son, you know, we gotta go meet up, dude. That'd be awesome. And, you know, I was hanging out with uh, some folks the other day and they were talking about all kinds of stuff that I did. I'm like, oh my God, you actually watch my videos? <laughs> and it was, it was pretty crazy. And I'm like, yeah, man, we, we know you, man. We saw you on so and so's video and this, that, and the other. It's like, oh, yeah, that's cool. So, like, we were talking and I came to the realization, you know, and I told them, I was like, so judging from what y'all are saying, I'm basically like the most famous, unfamous person ever. I'm like, the Forrest Gump of YouTube. I just happen to be like in the right situations at times. And it's like, yeah, it's like, okay, cool. <laughs> but in the beginning, I remember back in the day when I only had a measly 150 subs, I got approached by somebody uh, while I was waiting in line at McDonald's. And they were like, hey, are, are you are you the Andy-san? And I was like, uh, yeah. How do you know me, kid? <laughs> it's like, oh, dude, I watch your videos all the time. It's like, oh, hey, thanks, you know? And it kind, of, it kind of took me back because I didn't really think of myself as anybody noteworthy. I was just putting out rando videos on the internet, just trying to figure it out along with everybody else. But, you know, I got approached by this random kid at McDonald's who watched my videos. So it's like, okay, real human beings are actually watching this stuff somewhere. So question number seven. Looking back, what would I do differently? It's hard to say because I'm one of those guys that believes in everything happens for a reason. So even all the mistakes and stuff that I've gone through happened for a reason because it led me to this point, which then led me to this point or that point, and here I am today, 16 years later, talking about my time on YouTube. So it's hard for me to say if I would really do anything all that differently. Um, I guess if I had to say something, it would prob probably be to make more Navy related videos. Um, I felt really self-conscious about making Navy videos once I was really getting going with that because I got a lot of uh, weird comments about it and it, it really affected my confidence a lot. Uh, so I just kind of stopped doing the Navy videos until after I got out processed and then resumed those Navy videos. But I think if I really would have kept going, especially at that time, because I was one of the very few people in the service making videos about their military service and definitely was one of only a handful of people in the Navy talking about those things at that time. But I think I should have really stuck with it a bit more and then moving to Japan, you know, there's always that regret of like, oh, I should have gone to that place and film that place or done that thing or maybe I would have filmed this a little differently but like I said everything happens for a reason and we out here now so there's always time to go out there and uh, 
finish what you started. So question number eight, what's the best piece of advice I could give to somebody just starting out on YouTube? I would say to favor consistency over quality. Like I said earlier with the whole production value and stuff like that, yes, that is very prevalent, but there's also the other side of the spectrum of people just filming in this day and age, 240p shaky cam videos of whatever, and that still gets millions of views. So don't let camera quality be the arbiter between you doing or not doing YouTube. Just focus on making videos. Don't worry about you know trying to attract an audience right off the bat because nobody really knows who you are. They need a couple videos to kind of get to know you a little bit. And you also need to get a couple videos under your belt as well to develop the process and the consistency and figure out just what kind of videos you wanna make. You know, when I first started out, I was just making random vlogs of, of my life. And as I've said before, it's evolved into several different things over the years. It's evolved into documenting my life in the Navy, it's evolved into documenting my time in Japan, documented my time coming back to America to study as a 30 something year old, then dropping out and then going back to Japan to study abroad into my now mid thirties. And so it's covered a wide gamut of things, which I think in hindsight might've also affected some of my channel's uh, viability because of the ever shifting audiences. But it's also a key part of keeping things interesting. You know, you have to realize when stuff's getting a little stale and when to move on to something else. But if you're just starting out, really the thing you have to focus on is consistency. So don't go out and buy all this fancy schmancy stuff right off the bat. Just use your phone. That's something I didn't have when I was first starting out. I had to buy a dedicated camera and I had to have a desktop powerful enough with editing software to put together stuff. And now people can just go live on their phones. They don't even have to edit anymore. Hell, they don't even have to be on camera anymore. There's a lot of like just straight up voiceover channels now. So the world is yours, man. Just get out there and make that quality content. So question number nine, what's my favorite thing about doing YouTube? I have to say it is to use my creativity and problem solving skills in a format that's very interesting to me and to also be able to help other people as well. Uh, my other channel, Edit by Andy, covers a lot of video editing tutorials. So I teach you little how to's on how to uh, edit videos. And it also covers a little bit into uh, freelancing as well. So I'm always really interested in teaching people how to do new things and how to just better their lives. And I mean, even with this channel, uh, just teaching people how I managed to come out here to study abroad in Japan. What are some difficulties I faced along the way? What are some things to look out for? Maybe some little tips and stuff on just daily life out here in Japan. So even though this isn't my tutorial channel necessarily, I still feel like there has to be some sort of teachable moments in my videos for the most part anyway. Question number 10, the perfect 10. What is my least favorite thing about doing YouTube? Well, <laughs> there's a lot to not like about making content on the internet. It can range from just getting a whole bunch of haters, spouting a bunch of nonsense, ruining it for my regular audience, making stuff that doesn't necessarily get you anywhere. I think that's the one that really hurts me the most is really putting a lot of time and effort into a video that you think is gonna do really well, but ends up just getting a handful of views and maybe a couple like good job Andy comments, little golf clap comments, which I do appreciate, but it's still at the same time, it's like, you know, you put all this time and effort into something and it doesn't pay off and it can be very discouraging. Even for someone like me who's been doing this for a minute, it can be very discouraging to really like put yourself out there and really put some honest to goodness work into something and have it not come to fruition. But just know that even if the video doesn't do well, it doesn't mean that it won't eventually do well or that all the time and effort was for nothing. When working on a lot of big projects, even if they didn't pan out, I learned a whole lot about video editing, production, 
pacing, stuff like that. So there's always something to gain from everything, even if the project itself doesn't really turn out all that well. So question number 11, this question goes to 11. Why do I think it's worth it to get into making videos on YouTube when YouTube is already oversaturated? Or so it may seem. Now, this kind of falls into what I said earlier about the barrier to entry being much higher now than it was then. And the reality is there's always new barriers to overcome on YouTube, new niches to uncover, new topics to talk about. And even if there's not any new topics, there's always a new twist to things. If anything, if there's one thing that nobody can outperform you on is, well, being you. You are basically the niche in some cases because with vlogging, like, I'm not really doing anything that new. I mean, there's tons and tons and tons of other vloggers that do what I do and do it a lot better, quite frankly. And there's even a good amount doing it in Japan and also doing it quite better than me really underselling myself here. But I still have people that tune into what I do because I feel like I have a very unique perspective on things here in Japan, just because I'm me. All these other big vloggers and stuff like that, they can't outdo me being me. And besides, it's always good to see new faces on the platform. So question number 12, have I had any setbacks? And if so, what were they? Well, it seems like lately my channel is talking about nothing but setbacks. It's like I should rename this Andy the Setback Channel, basically. I jest though. Yeah, I've talked a lot about uh, my various setbacks over the years, uh, dealing with uh, just mental health, uh, depression, anxiety, stuff like that. And also with the current situation with old Koronsuke out there. Uh, just really affecting my mental health. Also, not getting accepted into the schools that I wanted to, but still finding a way to make it through and to reach my goals. Question number 13. What do I do about nasty or negative commenters? Even after 16 years, I still find it hard to deal with some comments. I mean, obviously there's ones that are just like straight up trolling and just, you know, putting out basic surface level stuff that's just kind of whatever just block delete move on but then there's others that kind of dig a little deeper and it's usually dealing with like my own sense of self insecurity so they find that little thing that even I was kind of thinking about it's like oh man I could have done this better in the video and then they just kind of you know jab in that little soft spot and it's like oh they thought it too mm, that sucks <laughs> you know I've had a lot of uh, negative experiences with uh, certain individuals on the platform and certain hate groups as well. I don't really have that good of advice on dealing with them because it's, like I said, it's hard for me to deal with these people. But the best thing I can think of is if they don't know you personally, why could you take what they say as personal? They don't know you. They just know what they see on a piece of glass is what you see here as we're talking in this moment really me or is it just a version of me that I'm putting on to illustrate certain points now obviously if you meet me in the real world it's going to be very similar but there's also going to be a lot of differences as well so how would you begin to make a sound judgment on somebody just knowing only a part of them just what they show you right best strategy honestly is to just block and move on don't even let it take any uh, of your mental energy away because otherwise you'll just whittle into nothing and you'll start really feeling antagonistic towards your audience because you're thinking that well if this person thinks this then everybody must be thinking it but they're not gonna say anything right when that's not the case at all. It's usually just a very, very vocal minority. And they're not even people who you want to be in your audience, you know? So why would you go around trying to please those people? You know, it's something that I had to learn the hard way, quite frankly, because I didn't want people not liking me on the internet, which is a complete impossibility. <laughs> There's always going to be someone out there who doesn't like you for whatever reason. And it may not even be a justifiable reason. It just maybe 
the way you look, the way you sound, just this weird way you say things or don't say things, you know, it might be off-putting to some people and that's okay. Question number 14, what equipment would I recommend for newbies? Like I said earlier, I would recommend just using whatever you have initially, because like I said, you're gonna be focusing most on consistency over quality. So if you do happen to have a camera just lying around the house, use that. If you don't have that, just use your phone. I mean, hell, Mr. Beast used an old iPhone to get started and look where he's at now. And if it turns out, hey, I kind of like this whole YouTube thing, then you can focus on getting new equipment, which is something I've done over the years. You know, when I first started out, I just used the old Sanyo Zacti pistol grip cameras, which were in the style at the time, not so much these days. And now I'm using a Sony a7C, which is like a full frame camera with a wide angle lens and this lovely Shure MV7 microphone. You know, try to make it as professional as I can with my friggin' humidifier in the background. So, you know, do what you can with what you have. So question 15, why do I think people are interested in me? It's kind of hard for me to say, to be honest, because I have my own perceptions of things, but that might be different from what the audience actually thinks. But I'd say it's just that I have a very relatable personality. I don't use a lot of the same like YouTuberisms. And I don't have that same like YouTubery type personality where it's like, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And just this very outgoing, gregarious style, you know? Like I start the videos kind of expressive and as I start to get in my groove, you know, I kind of, kind of slow down a little bit, become a lot more introspective. I notice I don't look at the camera as much. I don't know why that is. It's just a weird thing that I don't do. <laughs> um, I don't know, but I just become more introspective and just very much, you know, thinking about things rather than just, you know, being that wacky out there personality. And I think people really dig that, you know? They know that I'm not trying to bullshit them on some things and that I just present things as best I can. But I'd like to know what you guys think down below in the comments. Have to get my YouTuber shit in, right? <laughs> so let me know, because quite frankly, I don't know. And the last question, question number sweet 16. Do I ever get tired of filming things? And if so, why? Now this question is extremely important to me because it's not something that is really all that discussed on YouTube. Yeah, I, I do get tired of filming things. Um, just my own energy is very limited, you know? And I don't know if it's just because I'm an introvert or I'm getting older, maybe I'm overweight. I don't know, it could be a little of column A, a little column B, a little column C, maybe some other stuff that I haven't really thought about but I noticed that my own energy is limited and I have to make the best use of my energy because if I try to do YouTube all the time, it just gets very weird and awkward and I don't really know what to say and I like mumble through my words. So there's times where I do have to take a lot, in some cases, time off just to decompress from making stuff on YouTube as well as take care of stuff in the IRL with uh, school, work, things like that. So it's not all just about YouTube here, folks. You got to take care of business outside, you know, do a little TCB, baby. When the air is right and you got that good vibe energy going, flip on the camera, turn on the mic and sit down, make a video. All right, and we're recording. <laughs> and that's how it works. So yeah, guys, those were 16 questions to celebrate my sweet 16 year anniversary here on YouTube. And we're gonna bring it back old school, baby. So yeah, uh, this is Andy, sign up for now, thinking you guys poop for tuning into this video and others. And also wanna thank you guys for liking with the thumbs or the stars for all you old school followers out there. Comment, subscribing, send a few friends to the party. And hey, as always, we'll see you next time. Catch you later, guys. Bye.